turn to our monthly study of the book of first corinthians so if you would turn in your bibles to that book to chapter five we'll begin there in a couple moments in our first four lessons we've been discussing the main issue at corinth which is division we discovered that this division was in actuality caused by a lack of spirituality them trusting in the wisdom of men Instead of realizing that what they needed to follow was the word of God alone, the Corinthians had decided that they were going to follow after eloquent preachers, preachers that probably told them what they wanted to hear. Paul told them that they needed to change this mindset, for it would not lead them to heaven. If they chose not to do so, Paul said that when he came, his visit was not going to be a pleasant one. That was the end of chapter 4. Coming out of chapter 5, we do see a little bit of a transition. Yes, the overall topic is going to be division at Corinth, but what we're going to start to see is what happened to the church because of division. The results of division, if you will. So if you have our Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, let's read the first eight verses. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you, from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What is going on in Corinth? Well, because of their divisions, they were accepting sin and open sin to be present among members. What type of sin was this sin? Well, it was sexual immorality, as the New King James Version says, but the Greek word that is used here is the word porneia, P-O-R-N-E-I-A. And that Greek word means fornication sexual relations between two people who are not married to each other. Now our society as a whole doesn't frown upon fornication and such was true also in the Greek society. But Paul makes the point here that even the Gentiles don't practice what the Corinthian Christians were accepting, which was one of their members was in a sexual relationship with his father's wife. Now from the language used here by Paul, it does not appear that this man was involved with his birth mother, but his stepmother. Now both types of relationships would be equally wrong, but the reason that I am concluding that this man wasn't involved in a relationship with his birth mother was because Paul used the same type of language that was used in Leviticus as it concerns sexual relations with close kin. So if you would, turn to the book of Leviticus, to chapter 18. We're going to read verses 6 to 8. Leviticus 18, beginning at verse 6. Now of you, sorry, none of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness, which means having sexual relations with them. I am the Lord. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. Verse 7 tells Israel that they weren't to be intimate with their mother. But then verse 8 says that they weren't to be intimate with their father's wife. I 
would God repeat himself? Because their father's wife wasn't their birth mother, but what we would call their stepmother, or perhaps under Old Testament times, their father's concubine. But I thought we weren't under the law of Moses today. Where did God command us not to have these types of relationships in the New Testament? Well, 1 Corinthians 5 would be one of those places, but the prohibition against having sex with your parents or close kin predates Moses. For in Genesis 49, verses 1 to 4, we read, And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up into my couch. We can read uh, Reuben doing that earlier on in Genesis, but Jacob is acknowledging it here in uh, Genesis 49. Now, it shouldn't have to be said that we shouldn't be intimate with our birth mother or our stepmother or close kin. The Gentiles in Paul's day understood that even if they accepted other forms of fornication such as homosexuality. In chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is going to tell them that fornicators would not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet here, the Corinthian church, the church that Paul called the church of God in chapter 1, is accepting open fornication among them that not even the Gentiles would accept. They were arrogant in thinking that they were spiritual, that they had no all knowledge, yet had no problem accepting this wicked behavior. They should have been mourning over their attitudes, but they had not been. What should be done once they found out about that sin? What should they have done? They should have removed the person from their number. How, how was Paul to make such a determination? Where, because after all, all he heard was what re, was reported to him, presumably by Chloe's household. Shouldn't he have talked to the person involved to make sure that these accusations were true? Under normal circumstances, yes. If someone comes to us and tells us about misconduct of another person, we shouldn't automatically assume guilt. We should investigate the matter further. Jesus said as much in Matthew 18, verses 15 and 16, where he said, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you two, one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So yes, normally, Paul would have to talk to both sides in order to ascertain the truth. But Paul had something that we don't have. Miraculous inspiration and gifts of the Holy Spirit. When Paul wrote this letter, he was under the direction of the Holy Spirit. He said so in chapter 2. That gave him insight into the matter that he could make a judgment on without having to be present. And what was Paul's judgment? that they needed to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that he may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now this statement needs some unpacking so we understand what is being talked about. I've been a Christian since 2001, and I've been part of congregations where members have become involved in sin and the local church had to deal with it. In doing so, I can't recall it being mentioned that we were delivering such a one to Satan. Now that's what was being done, but what do we usually call this today? We call it withdrawing fellowship from someone. So what is being talked about here is church discipline. Why does Paul describe it here though as being delivered to Satan? Because the dominion or the domain of sin, the flesh, is the domain of Satan. Let's get a couple of verses that would show this. 
First, let's go to Romans 6 and read verses 15 and 16. Romans 6, beginning at verse 15. What then? Shall we, sin, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? If we obey the lusts of sin, we've presented ourselves as slaves to sin, which will lead to death if we continue in this without repentance. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, we read, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The person who practices righteousness is righteous and is of God. On the contrary, the person who practices sin is of the devil. Sin is not from God, and we should never think that it is, that it is or that it is okay to sin. Now, when Christians sin, they can repent and ask God for forgiveness. But one of the themes in 1 John is to show Christians that if they are following God, they will not be walking in sin. They will be walking in righteousness. They are walking in sin, meaning that they are making their life a life of sin by not repenting and seeking God's forgiveness. If they're doing that, then they are of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. So coming back to 1 Corinthians 5 now. The man that is under discussion chose to walk in sin and was unrepentant of that sin. He had already made himself a child of the devil. It was simply the task of the local church to acknowledge publicly what had happened. What was the purpose of doing this? Well, according to verse, according to 1 Corinthians 5, so that the flesh could be destroyed and the spirit saved. Sin is often talked about as the flesh. And it does and Galatians 5:19 would be an example of this. Paul is not telling the Corinthians to go out and execute this man so that his spirit can be saved. No, he's saying, deliver him to Satan. Inform this man who he belongs to so that he can realize that his soul is in danger of being cast away. If this man has any concern about where he will spend eternity, he will put off the flesh by putting away this sin, and he will return to following the Lord. If he will do this, then God would forgive him, according to 1 John 1 verse 9, and he could be saved. We see then that church discipline needs to be exercised when there is no repentance for open sin. But we need to remember, though, when we do this, that this is an action of love, not hate. A church should be so concerned with a person's soul that we actually talk to them about it. If you go to the doctor for a checkup, not thinking that anything's wrong, you just go for a, your annual checkup, and they do tests and they find out that you have cancer in your lungs, cancer that can be treated, would you want them to tell you about it? Or would you want them to remain silent and allow you to die of that cancer? For me, I tell them I want the doctor to tell me. And I'm sure you would too. Knowing that someone is in sin and doing nothing about it so as to not cause a public disturbance is not an act of love. It is an act of hate. I do not want to see anybody go to hell. Nobody. And if a fellow Christian has entangled themselves in sin, either knowingly or unknowingly, it is my duty to tell them about it. Now the first step isn't taking the matter to the church. No, let's go back and read Matthew 18, verses 15 and 16, but then let's add verse 17. Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. 
And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. If he refuses even to hear the church, let him to be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. All sin has the ability to keep us out of heaven. But every time a person sins and someone else knows about it, it doesn't mean that the matter needs to be brought to the church right away. It doesn't concern the congregation as a whole and can be dealt with privately, then it should be dealt with privately, one-on-one. -on -one. If the person won't repent, then others should be brought in in order to determine the facts. If after the facts have been determined and it is concluded, concluded that the person did in fact sin and are in need of repentance, and they still refuse to do so, then it needs to be brought to the attention of the church. For we have a person who is not walking according to the scriptures. What was going on in Corinth, everybody knew about. I'm fairly certain by Paul's language that some didn't approve of this behavior and would have confronted the man. For if everybody approved of it, how would Paul have found out he wasn't there? With this man refusing to repent, the only other option was to withdraw fellowship from him. It was to be done in love. It was to be done in sorrow with an eye towards saving this man's soul before he would face the judgment seat of Christ. But there's another purpose for delivering a man to Satan. And it was so that this type of behavior didn't spread and infect the whole church. The way Paul illustrates this point is through the use of leaven. Those who bake bread understand that only a small amount of leaven is in relationship to the flour that is used. This past week, I decided to make bread. The recipe I used would make two loaves of bread, and it required five to six cups of flour. The was required two and a quarter teaspoons. When compared to the flour, that is a very small amount. But that very small amount, when mixed with the flour and the other ingredients, and then kneaded together to make the dough, causes the entire dough to rise over time, allowing you to make leavened bread. That's how sin works in the local church, too. As far as we, as far as we know, th it is only the, this man that was engaged in this type of fornication. We don't know how large the Corinthian church was, but from the pictures we get in 1 Corinthians, this church was probably rather large. Let's say it was 50 people. That would mean that if this man was the only one involved in this type of open sin, only 2% of the congregation was engaging in fornication, assuming that the woman who was involved was not a Christian. That's not a large percentage, right? 2%? But by allowing this sin to be accepted could have caused other sins to be accepted or the same sin in other people. You might have brother so-and-so say, well, if that guy can get away with fornication, I can get away with adultery. And his sister so-and-so might say, well, then I can get away with theft. And on and on it goes until you no longer have 2% of the congregation in open sin, but 20 to 30% of the congregation. And of course, the younger generation is watching what the older generation is doing, and either they don't become Christians in the first place, or become Christians but follow in the sinful footsteps of their parents. That's how denominations start, with just one departure from the scriptures that eventually leads to a complete departure from the scriptures. Accepting sin is like playing with fire. Eventually, you will burn the house down. So in delivering this man over to Satan, they would be purging out the old leaven so that they may be a new lump, an unleavened lump, free from sin. For Christ, our Passover lamb, had been sacrificed. Now you might think, well, hold on a minute. We've been talking about leaven. What does the Passover have to do with this? This is an example of not knowing a little bit about the Old Testament, making it harder to understand the New Testament. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to start reading at verse 1. 
Exodus 12, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth month, and on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall, take, you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water but roasted in fire its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So Move leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were festivals that occurred back to back. And thus in the Gospels, when we read the Gospels, they are often referred to as the same festival. The Passover commemorated when God passed over the houses of the Israelites that had the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and lentils while he killed the firstborn of every family that did not have the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and lentils. The Feast of Unleavened Bread commemorated Israel's release from Egyptian bondage, and the fact that they had to leave Egypt quickly without allowing their dough to rise. As part of this entire eight-day feast, not only were they not to eat any leaven, but they weren't allowed to have any leaven in their houses. So before this feast began, they were to purge or remove the old leaven from their houses. It is important that they do this if they wanted to observe this feast correctly. Well, in 1 Corinthians, Jesus is said to be our Passover. The death of Jesus is described in many ways in the New Testament, using many types and antitypes. But one of the ways is through the use of the Passover. Just as the Lamb was slain for the Passover, Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain. Just as the blood of the Lamb was placed on the doorposts and lentils of Israel's houses, when we obey Christ, His blood is placed on our spirits, so to speak. We are said to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And just as the blood of the Lamb delivered Israel from God's judgment, the blood of Christ delivers Christians from God's judgment through the forgiveness of sins. To make that comparison even more clear, when was Jesus crucified? It was not only during the Passover time, but it was during the very time that the Passover lambs were being slain. 
Reading from John 18, 28, it becomes clear that the Passover meal was still ahead when Jesus was crucified. And so Israel, following the commands found in Exodus 12, would have been slaying the Passover lambs while Jesus was hanging on the cross. That is why it is apt to describe Jesus as our Passover. But before Israel observed the Passover, they would have purged the old leaven from their houses. Those who would be Christians must do the same and purge out the old leaven, sin, from their lives. The Corinthian church, however, had allowed the leaven to seep back in, and they needed to purge it out again so that they could keep the feast with sincerity and truth. Paul here was not commanding the Corinthians to keep the Jewish Passover. The feast of Passover was the type. The antitype was the manner of life in which we are to live, a holy life. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, we read, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our lives are not to be lives of sin, but ones of holiness, where we live lives that are good and acceptable to God. Unless we think that that is something that we cannot do, Paul here in Romans 12 says that this is our reasonable service. God is not expecting too much of us. We can do it. The Corinthians could do it. In order to make sure that they would, they needed to purge out the sin from among them and withdraw fellowship from the one walking in sin. But Paul's warnings against accepting sinful behavior among them could create the opportunity to have his teachings be misapplied. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 5 and read to the end of the chapter, starting at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 9. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not jo judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves this evil person. That's interesting to note that we call this book, the one we're reading from now, the book of 1 Corinthians. And we do so because we have two letters written by Paul to the Corinthians. But as is true with other letters of Paul, we don't have all of them. We have all we need to obey God, but we don't have all of them. There is another epistle that Paul wrote to the Corinthians that we don't have. If we did, we would call that one the book of 1 Corinthians, this one the book of 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians the book of 3 Corinthians. What did Paul write in this other epistle to the Corinthians? We don't know entirely, and we don't need to know because the Holy Spirit didn't preserve it for us. What we do know is that it contained Paul's warning not to keep company with, this, with sexually immoral people or those who are in open sin. Since this is true, what then were they doing keeping company with this brother in Christ who was sexually immoral? My only, my only conclusion is that they took Paul's warning as to include those that were not part of the church. In other words, they were in the world. If, however, these people were Christians, they were brothers in Christ, and therefore they should be accepting of them. Paul is saying that's not what he meant and is now clarifying the issue. While it is true that Christians should be careful with our relationships with the world, we are not commanded to go out of the world. We do not have to become Amish and live in an isolated community in order to serve Christ. We aren't to join the world in their sins for sure, but in order to bring people to Christ, we actually have to go out and teach them. We thus have to leave to God to judge the sins of those in the world. However, among the local church, we are to judge those 
who are living in sin and not keep company with them, not even to eat with them. But I thought that God would be judge of everyone. He is. And he will hold us responsible for the things that we do. But he commands local churches to keep themselves pure and to withdraw from those who live in sin. To not do so would go against the word of God. When a church does this, it is to be a congregational action, one that they all decide to follow. It might put a strain on families, but hopefully such a strain will cause the erring Christian to return to Christ. Unfortunately, this congregation has had to withdraw from some members while I've been here. But you want to know what? We've had two of those people return to Christ, whom we withdraw from. Church discipline works if we let it. It will be hard, but if done properly, can lead to repentance. So in closing this chapter, Paul reminds the Corinthians it is not their job to cure society of all its sins. That's far too big a task for them. Their job is to teach the gospel, but is also to ensure that sin is being dealt with when, uh, among those of the congregation, and discipline is being practiced when necessary. Immorality defiles the church. It has the ability to, ca to cause an entire local church to walk away from serving God if we let it. The only way to prevent this is to be vigilant, to confront sin head on when we see it and try to get our brothers to repent. Withdrawing of fellowship should be the last resort, but it does need to be done when a Christian won't see the error of their ways and they refuse to repent. May we follow the will of God in this regard and in all things that he commands us to do. I'm not ashamed.